My name is Frank Marsick and I'm an Associate Research Scientist and a lecturer at the University of Michigan. In short, I teach meteorology courses at the University of Michigan. Um, I came to the University of Michigan actually back in 1980 uh, to start studying meteorology. I think like a lot of kids, I used to watch the weathermen on TV and try to understand if school was going to be canceled because of a big snowstorm. And eventually over time I started wondering not if, but why. And so that's kind of what led me to want to study meteorology as a career. And so I did that. I studied at the University of Michigan from 1980 to 1984. That's the typical length of time for a bachelor's degree. And then I worked at a couple of television stations for about seven years. And at some point along the way, I decided to return to school to go to graduate school because I wanted to learn more about meteorology. And as time went on, I found that not only did I like talking about it, I liked teaching it. And so uh, over time, I started teaching courses in meteorology at the University of Michigan um, over 10, 15 years ago, and I'm still doing it today. One of the most important weather forecasts really in all of world history <laughs> is what a lot of people are saying, the forecast for D-Day, June 6, which was originally scheduled for June 5, 1944. But General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, had a team of meteorologists and they were made up of British meteorologists as well as American meteorologists. But his chief meteorologist was James Stagg from the Britain uh, Meteorological Service. So the question we have is, can you describe just the process that went into creating or practicing for that forecast with such high pressure on his shoulders for coming up with an accurate forecast, which really impacted more than up to, or up to 150,000 troops had to move across the English Channel that day. I think one of the first things to talk about is the fact that how how Stag prepared for this, and, and he did the perfect thing if you're going to start forecasting for an area you've not usually forecasted before, and that is that he went and he started looking at the climatology of the area. We need to distinguish between a couple terms here. One is weather which is the day-to-day -day or short-term variation of things like clouds and precipitation and, and winds and temperature and climate. Those are the conditions that kind of, when you average it out over 10, 20, 30 years, you expect to see on a regular basis. We often call those the climate normals because that's normally what we like to see. And so what Stagg did is for a long period of time, he looked at the data from many years back to understand on average what are the conditions that you typically see um, in the month of June, May and June across the English Channel? And so the problem is that the data that he was looking at came from a lot of different sources over different time periods. And so it really had to work hard to pull this all together. But the idea was that Stag would be able to have a general feeling for what the weather might be like during the time that they were expecting to do or, or planning for the invasion of Normandy. The problem is that that average over that 30 year period or more is made up of a lot of different instances. And once we actually got to, or they actually got to, the time where they were considering the invasion, the conditions were quite abnormal, in fact. And uh, it was one of the things that really caught the forecasters off guard um, was the very unique nature. The strength of the storms that they were seeing um, at this time were more characteristic of what you would see in the wintertime, not the summertime. And can you speak to just put yourself back in Stagg's shoes in 1944 because throughout um, many accounts there were many disagreements between all the forecasters. Mm -hmm. So could you talk to how Stagg reconciled all those differences of opinion? Yeah, I think one of the reasons why Stagg was actually chosen for his position was he had the personality <laughs> to take a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different ideas and kind of bring them together into a final solution. And they had a tremendous challenge. As I look back uh, upon what they did, the thing that I'm really amazed at is how they were able to do so well with such little data. Let me give you an example. In my classes, if we're going to uh, start uh, to make a forecast, the first thing I tell the students is, you first have to understand what's happening now in the area you're forecasting for, why it's happening, so what's helping to cause that, 
and then you start to take those features and move them into the future. So in order for us to understand what's happening, we have observations from airports and other locations, we have satellite data, we have radar data, and then once we use all of that to get a picture of what's happening, then we look at our computer models and we project that into the future. Stagg and his colleagues, basically all they had was the surface observations. The uh, satellite data would not come for several decades. Radar data were still at least a decade or two away. And the numerical weather prediction models wouldn't actually come around until the 1950s. They had some basic models, but not to run them on a computer and really use them on a routine basis. So what they did is basically there were a lot of different techniques they could use to try to take the current conditions and figure out what was happening next. Part of the reason why there were such different of, differences of opinions is the different groups were using different approaches. What the U.S. Uh, forecasters did is uh, Colonel Crick had put together an approach in which he had cataloged all different types of, of weather systems for many years in the past, and they would take the current conditions and try to find an analog. What was a situation in the past that looked exactly or very nearly exactly the same as the conditions that particular day. And then what they would do is they would take that past occurrence and make the assumption that since they're so similar, they're going to evolve similarly over the next several days. And so that's what they would do. They would take what happened in the past and say, this is what's going to happen in the future. The British were using a slightly different approach. They were following an approach that had begun in Norway a couple decades earlier in which they had reviewed all kinds of weather systems and sort of noticed that there was a certain pattern to how weather systems developed. And so they were kind of leaning on that approach and also just about this time we're finally starting to get observations of the upper atmosphere and they knew that what was happening at the surface was closely linked to what was happening in the upper atmosphere. And as a result, the British were using kind of this combination of the Norwegian approach and really incorporating the upper level data. The Americans were using largely their analytical approach. And so these two groups were using somewhat different data, using different approaches. And so it's really not surprising that the answers that they were coming up with for future weather over the next couple of days would be quite different. When we get into the actual forecast of June 4th, 5th, and 6th, Stag noticed something that no one else did, if you could speak to that. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it was a brilliant move when it was suggested that Stag and his, his team actually start running through a series of practice forecasts. Now, think about it if you're talking about a baseball team. If you had a shortstop who might be very, very good at what they do, but to what makes a team effective is all the different or all the different players working together. So it was really important you had all these experts who were really good at what they did, but they had to learn to work together. And one of Stagg's main um, jobs was to try to take all these different ideas and pull them together. So before they even approached D-Day, they started working on a forecasting approach where they were ex assuming that they were several days away from the invasion, and so they started putting together forecasts for the actual invasion. And as Stagg notes in his book, as important were the conditions in the days following, because once they actually established presence on the beachhead, they then needed to reinforce the troops that were there, the supplies that were there. So they needed not only good conditions the day before and during the day of the invasion, but also in the days that follow. Okay, so let's get into the forecast for June 4th, 5th, and 6th. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, at some of the maps. And so the first one that we're going to bring up is June 5th. This was initially the day that they anticipated um, that they would be doing the invasion. And I think there's a couple things that we want to talk about this map first. Okay, One of the things is that you can see that where we have uh, these areas of low pressure, they actually have the word low written on them, they're in the middle of a series of concentric circles. And where the lines of those circles are close together, that means there's a very strong pressure gradient and the winds are going to be very strong. And so that was a very... Uh, those were the conditions that they actually wanted to avoid. That would have made it very difficult for the amphibious vehicles to bring the troops on shore. Also, you notice down in the lower left-hand corner, we have that broad area of high pressure. 
this was one of the points of contention between the different forecasters. The Americans felt fairly comfortable that that area of high pressure was going to be working its way eastward, helping to relax the winds, decrease the cloudiness in the skies, and make conditions favorable for the invasion actually to occur on the 5th. What the British forecasters were more concerned with were these two low pressure centers that you can see on the map expecting them to move primarily eastward and therefore continuing to provide some unsettled weather for the forecasters or for the for the forecast time period and so this was some of the back and forth that the forecasters were were um, having is which was going to prevail this series of weather systems or this broad area of high pressure that the uh, uh, that the US forecasters thought might bring the kind of conditions that they actually needed on June 5th itself one of the things you can see is right now you see that cold front that's stretching um, across the northern part of Europe, across the northern part of France, and it's passed through the English Channel at this point. The day before, on the 4th, when they were actually finally making the decision whether or not to postpone the invasion, there was great concern about what this front would do, what this weather system would do. And, and eventually the decision was made that this weather system and possibly the next system moving in quickly behind it were just going to bring this continuous stretch of poor weather. And so they sort of decided against what the U.S. forecasters had, had suggested was going to occur. That night, one of the things they found as we went into the early morning hours of the 5th was they realized that this frontal boundary, this cold front, was actually starting to work its way through Scotland and was racing to the south. Now they weren't exactly sure why that was there because there are actually several weather systems that had sort of combined north of the, of the area of interest. But one thing they realized at that point was that that front was probably going to move through and take some of the strong winds and clouds with it as the weather system itself was starting to weaken and so those pressure lines were going to get farther apart and the wind conditions would be more favorable. And it was at that point that Stagg realized there might actually be a window of opportunity on Tuesday once this front had moved far enough to the south. Can you explain exactly how you re are reading the cold fronts and the warm fronts and the pressure systems? Sure. So we've already talked a little bit about where the low pressure centers are, right? And, and those are clearly marked. But what we are seeing in these frontal boundaries are there. Those are actually, the reason why they're called fronts is they're the front or leading edges of different air masses. So the warm front is the leading edge of an area of warmer air and that usually has a lot of humidity as well and can help in the formation of clouds. The cold fronts, and the cold fronts are the lines here that have the tri small triangles on them, that's the front or leading edge of colder air. Usually once that moves through, you often have conditions that will settle down a little bit. The, the clouds are usually associated oftentimes with the fronts themselves. So once the idea was realized, or they realized that those fronts were actually going to be dropping to the south, of the um, English Channel, they realized that some of the heavier clouds and the lower clouds would be moving south as well. And so the conditions that the troops really needed, which were um, not much cloudiness, and if the clouds were there, they needed them to be fairly high off the ground. Um, and also the winds would be weakening as well. And that was very important, as we mentioned, with the amphibious forces. Okay, so let's then go into once the decision was made to delay it from June 5th to June 6th, explain the process or the forecast that allowed Eisenhower, in his famous words, saying, okay, let's go. So as we're taking a look at the different maps, and, and now we're looking at the one from the 6th, you kind of see what I was talking about has played out. The low pressure center with its associated lines of constant pressure, those concentric circles that I've talked about, those lines are now much farther apart. So that means the winds across the area of interest were much weaker. Not to say they were weak, they were still quite strong and caused some problems, but at least they were in the range of wind speeds that would allow the operation to move forward. Also, you can see that that cold front, that line with the triangles has pushed well to the south. And as a result of that, um, the heavier clouds moved to the south as well, and we had that window of opportunity that Eisenhower needed in order to get the, the, um, the operation initiated. 
One of the other things I think that's really interesting about this, right, is that you know at the same time the German forecasters are trying to check this out as well and trying to understand when the Allied forces might move. One of the things that's really interesting is if you take a look at these various maps, you can see that there's many observations over land, but not much over the oceans. And also, as you go farther west, the Allied forces had the advantages of having Canadian and U.S. observations as well. So the Allied forces, when they were trying to understand where these fronts are going to be, had a lot more information upwind, if you will, of the area of interest than the Germans did. All this weather data was classified information. And so the Allied forces could see basically what was coming, and the Germans had much less of an idea what was actually headed toward the area of interest. All right, let's go on to June 7th, the day after D-Day, which was still a very important day because many more troops were still attempting to land on the beach for, with supplies and backups and reinforcements. So what happened on June 7th with the weather? Well, the thing we need to keep a close eye on is there's that area of low pressure just to the east of the British Isles. You can see it says 1,003 in the middle. That's the, that's the pressure. Um, that's being measured uh, in the in the center of that low pressure area. Earlier, the previous two days, that was 900 and something. So in other words, the pressure is increasing. That means this weather system is slowly dying. It's weakening. And you can see, once again, those lines of constant pressure across the area of interest are getting farther and farther apart. So the winds are weakening. The other thing that's interesting is that broad area of high pressure that was over the Azores, off to the south and west, that originally thought might bring the clear conditions and that the U.S. forecasters were relying on. Even though that didn't play a role in that first day of the invasion, you can now see that that's starting to edge over into that area. So it actually did play a role once you got to the 7th, allowing those lighter winds and uh, relatively cloud-free conditions to allow the re the uh, resupply missions and things like that to continue. Today we have all kinds of information. We have um, all types of satellite information to tell us exactly what's happening over the oceans and the forecasters then had very little information. The information they had over the oceans to know exactly where the centers of these high and low pressure areas were, many of, much of that information came from ships that were at sea. Well, this was wartime, and they're not going to be staying in the same location. So they're moving around and, and trying to get a feel for where these are was a very difficult proposition. So the U.S. forecasters understood that that Azores high was there, and it might have a very positive influence. But the real question was, what was going to happen with those weather systems, those low pressure systems that were tracking to the north? Eventually, they weakened enough that that high pressure center that the U.S. forecasters were really focusing on did start to have an important impact. So at the um, end of the book, which Stagg wrote in 1971, many years after D-Day, he still felt that even with the technology in the 1970s, he was very comfortable with the forecasts that they made in 1944. Can you explain uh, just the, w what they had to compensate for not having that data? I know you mentioned that earlier, mm -hmm. but why did he feel so comfortable in, in terms of the forecast? What, what else would he... Um, or what did he see in 1944 or have at his disposal that stood the test of time? I actually found that to be a really interesting statement because throughout the book he talks about how uncertain <laughs> he was um, that he would say that he would say that. But yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that he knew he had some of the um, most talented forecasters in the world working together as a team. And I think that that was part of it, that, that they had a group of people that could share their experiences to give different ideas and that they could pull all that information together and then kind of come to a, some sort of a consensus as to what the most likely scenario was as opposed to a single person using all the information by yourself. So the, I, I think that the team approach that he had I think was probably what he was referring to, that, that they had um, all these great minds that were really kind of pooling their, their experience together. And as we said, the, Amer the U.S. forecasters were wise to keep an eye on that, that area of high pressure. And um, so, you know, they were focused on that and maybe they didn't consider the strength of the systems to the north or didn't think that they would evolve as they did. But, you know, that was important to always keep people thinking about that other factor. Today, 
there are actually a lot of different models. Some of them that focus on only a 24 or 36 hour period, some of them even a shorter forecast period than that. Some that go out to 10, 14 days. There are all kinds of different models that are developed with different assumptions that people use to forecast. And since those models are all slightly different, it's not a surprise that you're going to have a slightly different result. So it didn't matter whether those were conceptual models based on years of looking at past data or if they were computerized models. The fact is they were slightly different approaches and they were going to give slightly different results. And I think one of the things that, that's important in the book that's talked about is the pressure that was on Yates. Yates was the American forecaster, the US forecaster that was helping Stagg. And you could tell, in, is reading it, and, and Stagg mentions that at different times, he could tell that Yates was torn because he had used the approaches that the US forecasters had, right? And so he was allied with that group. And that was his tendency is to want to agree with his compatriots whereas Stagg was trying to pull all this together. And so it was kind of interesting. Those two often had a tension between them, but it never erupted into the arguments that came up between the actual different forecast groups. Yates and Stagg had a very good working relationship. And so even though there were differences, they always kind of kept calm and came upon the best compromise solution. Stagg mentions when they made the decision to delay to June, from June 5th to June 6th, it was bright sunny weather. And the irony was not lost on him that when they gave the go ahead, it was horrible weather. <laughs> so talk about trusting the science. Yeah, that's really important. Um, the important part was that even though they knew what the conditions were over them, that the conditions actually were cloudy and they weren't very good, they did have information from, as I mentioned, there were ships out to sea, there were reconnaissance aircraft that were looking at what conditions were. They had information farther to the north and west where these different systems were coming from. And so they knew that the conditions had been observed that were going to be more favorable for them. And they just had to trust that the people they were talking to, in a sense, knew what they were, do what they were doing, um, that they had actually seen you know, consistent clearing patterns and things like that. What amazes me is, is how good of a job that they did with how little of information they had. Um, it's very, it's easy for us to take a look at satellite data and say, oh, here's this, this area of cloud starting to move and oh, it makes sense that it matches up with this feature that we're seeing on the maps of the, the, of the surface observations and things like that. And they just simply didn't have that advantage. They had some information about what was happening in the surface. They had a little bit of information about what was happening over the oceans, but um, their information was very sparse. And so it's not surprising that again, with that sparse of information, with using different conceptual models that these different forecasters would have um, would have different ideas. And so Stagg was amazing in that Stagg, through this whole thing, was able to maintain his composure, be able to pull together the key pieces of information that he needed. And I think something you mentioned before, he also understood that his job was not to make the call about what happens. It was simply to provide um, the information um, as terms of what the, uh, the commanders might actually use. If a student is interested in becoming a meteorologist, mm -hmm. and let's say they're in middle school, mm -hmm. what would you recommend courses that they look forward to taking in high school, how to mm -hmm. prepare to get into a college and do well in meteorology? So uh, one of the things I was actually surprised about when I got into college was that uh, the study of meteorology actually is a fair amount of mathematics. Um, the way we describe the motions in the atmosphere, we use different mathematical equations. And so uh, being a strong student in math is really important. Uh, we also use a lot of information um, from the forecast models or we're pulling information from a lot of different places. And so being comfortable and starting to learn a little bit about how to how to write computer code and things like that. To have some familiarity with that and a lot of uh, schools and middle schools and high schools that have these robotics teams use basic computer programs to control those robots and so you know just getting involved in projects like that so you're really comfortable with um, computing languages and like I said have a strong background in math and uh, just really a love of the science. I, I always tell people that the students I see that that excel the most in 
in, in really any field are those that are really passionate about it. So if you're passionate about the weather you see around you and you kind of develop some of those skills, I think you've got a, a good chance of, of really enjoying a career in meteorology. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. You're welcome.